Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? A certified public accountant and an experienced finance professional who loves their career and believes we all have knowledge, experiences, and a purpose to add value, contribute to society, and enrich the lives of others. As a personal finance advocate, Holly is dedicated to helping adults and the next generation manage their finances as responsible stewards. She grew up in a household where, quote, we may have been poor in material possession, but we were rich in love, family values, and an unwavering work ethic. Our lack exposed the economic disparities and piqued my interest to understand the economic landscape and specifically money management. In 2012, Holly created the Master Playbook to break the cycle of paycheck-to-paycheck living and to help adults and the next generation create a financial legacy worth leaving. She has educated thousands of people through her book, speaking engagements, and coaching sessions using sound financial principles, practical tips, and her personal experiences. Today, we are honored to welcome Holly Reed to change the narrative with J.D. Fuller. Holly D. Reed, CPA. Welcome to Change the Narrative. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And thank you for being flexible. You know, booking is just such a crazy experience. So thank you so much for uh, for your patience with me. So I want to get started with a little background. First of all, okay. where where are you from and how were you raised? Just like a general sort of overview. Yep. So um, I am from Atlanta, Georgia, born and raised. ATL. Uh, yes, ATL, born and raised right here in the South. Uh, my my dad is from Atlanta. My mom is actually from Montgomery, Alabama. And so they met while they were both trying to go to school here in Atlanta. Um, my dad at Morehouse, my mom at... Um, Grady's nursing school back in the day, right? And so they used to take classes at Spelman College. And so that's how she and my dad met. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I love all this. I love all this HBCU dropping. Go ahead. Keep it going. (laughs) Yes. And um, uh, they they come from both, both sides, very large family. So my dad was one of nine. My mom was one of 11. And I am here today, the youngest of four. So um, have always grown up surrounded by lots of families, uncles, aunts, cousins. Um, My maternal grandmother lived until she was 104. So there's always just been family, family gatherings. um, And uh, it's, it's been awesome. So my sisters all actually live here now. We didn't at one point. We were all over the place. But as my as my parents have gotten older, we've all kind of come back home uh, to Atlanta. I actually went to North Carolina A and T in Greensboro, North Carolina, for school, and uh, came right back. But they, my my family life, my uh, the way that I was brought up has really just influenced the work that I do today. What what would you say is the main theme that was um, sustained throughout your upbringing? Yeah, so the main theme I would say is that uh, my parents were strong believers that education was the great equalizer, right? And so because that, yeah. we, yeah, because they both grew up in large households, there wasn't a whole lot. They learned to do a lot with less and that carried over even into our immediate family, right? So I'm the youngest of four. There are five years between me and the oldest. And so that theme kind of carried through where education was the key, like what was pitched to us, ingrained in us. Um, and so they took that very seriously and did so much to make sure we were in the right school system, right? Um, like doing extra things to make sure we, anything that was accessible to us, that we participated in it, whether that was sports, whether that was having us bust to schools 
across country. I mean, you know, across the city just yeah. to uh, make sure we got the quality education that they know we deserved. Um, whether that was, you know, my mom just being really involved, one of those active, intentional parents was involved with the PTA, would show up at the school unannounced, was pushing for us to have perfect attendance in, in grade school, like all the things. So I would say that was the that was the theme for for yeah. us growing up and them just setting those ex- expectations um, high so that, you know, our economic situation or what where we may have been lacking in economics was no excuse because, you know, education was going to be the key for us to get everything that belonged to us. You know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm the youngest of nine as well. And oh, so, I, yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your, your father, was it that's the youngest of nine? It'd be interesting mm-hmm. to hear his perspective on what that's like, because, well, you know, the he, lessons he, learned. Yeah, he's not the, I'm the youngest. My dad is probably, he might be too removed from the youngest. You about to get okay. me in trouble for not knowing this off the top of my <laughs> head. Okay. That's a lot of them. <laughs> So you're the youngest and he's in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, because, I mean, a family of nine, it has its own interesting dynamic. So um, it's a lot of people and your mom had even more. So it's it's it's, it's, it's curious to think, what are the message that you sustain with so many people and so many layers? So that that's of interest to me. And as the youngest, it sounds like it all trickled down to you pretty succinctly. Oh, yeah. So uh, you know how it is. They you, the oldest probably gets it the worst, <laughs> or they set the highest expectations uh, for the oldest. And then because I'm the youngest, I'm watching, I'm observing, I'm taking it all in, and then I'm mimicking. Right. So that's what you did. Now that's what I'm gonna go do as well. And I know some cases where the youngest just totally bucks the system, uh, but the genes. <laughs> The genes in me, I was, I am the rule follower. So wow. uh, me going and majoring into accounting was like perfect. There are rules. <laughs> it's the numbers. The it's black and white. And wow. um, so just so you know, it's interesting that we're bringing this up, right? So me being the rule follower, I know now, you know, as I get older and wiser, just how difficult that made it for me to find my own voice right Mm. to to find what's my thing because I'm just so used to being following the rules and being rewarded for being told what I'm to do what I'm supposed to do right somebody tells me what to do and then I say yes ma'am and I go do it and you know just being you know a child and being taught that you don't speak up kids are supposed to be seen and not heard and just those narratives right that we that I heard I I don't want to generalize but that I heard as a child and how that played into um, me just going along checking the boxes until you have your own experiences or have your own um, things that go against it and then you're like wait a minute I sh- I need to speak up I need to say something I need to do things differently. And so, um, so yeah, it's very interesting to, to kind of reflect and look back on my own childhood as to why and what I do today. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. um, you know, hearing you talk about being a rule follower and doing all those wonderful things, the youngest of four, I feel like I owe my parents an apology. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was none of those things. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure I didn't follow every rule, but you know, I didn't stray far from the. <laughs> some of us can, some of us far. just can't. I love that too. Okay. Uh, I, I do have a sister who did stray. So, you know, it's just like you said, the dynamics of growing up with multiple siblings, different personalities, even though you all grow up in the same household and turn out to be completely different people with yeah. opinions and passions. Uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> you know, one of the things you talk about is, you know, black parenting one-on-one children are seen and not, and not heard. I mean, that, that's just kind of 
the ground rules, you know? So I, I, I hear that. I think we can say that pretty generally and, and uh, not offend. I want to talk about finances. This is what you do. You do it well. You've written a book. We'll get into that. But right now okay. I want to talk about the biggest life lesson you learned in the financial realm. What was the biggest financial lesson you learned early on? Okay. And I, I early on, um, okay. So I'm trying to think of how early I want to go. So early on, um, one of the things I recognized early on was the difference between kind of the haves and the have nots, right? So mm -hmm. we grew up in a neighborhood that was middle to lower class, majority black. But then my parents early on made a decision to uh, have my oldest sister tested that, you know, she was gifted, she was smart, she was ahead of her class, and then had us bust to Buckhead for school, right? To be educated. And Buckhead is like known to be the elite neighborhood. You know, it's where the rich and the wealthy live in Atlanta. Um, and I lived and grew up in Bankhead. And everybody, everybody, when you think of Bankhead, um, you think of, I'm trying to think the most popular person out of Bankhead might be T.I., uh, one of the rappers, or, you know, there's been so much music and, and things that have come out of um, our community. But when you look at the two, very different, right? So just early on, I could recognize the disparities because once you hit a certain journey on that school bus, you you see things change pretty quickly. And at, as a young child, it had me asking questions like, well, well, why is that? Well, why do... Why does their library look like this and ours looks like this? And why did you, why are we going to the school, you know, 15 miles away when there's a high school right down the street from us? Um, so just asking those questions and just paying attention, but again, not asking too loudly, um, but just noticing those differences and knowing that there was a difference. Um, and I love that question because so that was, that was one of the first things early on. Can you repeat the question? Because there was another story that it triggered yeah. for me like sure. a little later. Sure. What did you learn as your biggest life lesson that was financially related? Yes. Okay. So the biggest lesson I learned actually came when I started dating. <laughs> and um, I dated in, in my early 20s. I started dating this guy. He was from Jamaica. And he was an entrepreneur. He owned his own um, shoe repair business, right? He owned his own shoe repair business. And um, we we talk about life and dreams and everything. And one of the things he impressed upon me early on, he was like, you know what? The United States, America has you got, have you all brainwashed, brainwashed to believe that you can't do anything without a formal education without a formal degree or a certification and um, because he, he didn't go to college. And so, but yet he was successful in his own right as a small business owner. Um, and he would hear stories all the time, people coming into his shop who shared how, you know, they couldn't do this or they couldn't do that because they couldn't afford to go back to school to get the degree or they couldn't go, they couldn't afford to take, this, you know, test prep to get this specific certification. And so um, just listening to that and realizing like my eyes being open to, man, you are absolutely right. There are so many success stories. We know today, billionaires even, who didn't have a college degree, who didn't have a formal education, but took their gift, took their craft, took their interest, passion, their own, th themselves being just self-motivated that propel them to be the best in their industries or, um, you know, propel them to achieve financial success. And so that was a big eye opener um, for me. And one of the biggest lessons I think I learned before it was popular um, for people to take different paths. You know, as you're saying it, I can feel myself like a little bit nervous because I'm from that age group and that experience where education lays the foundation. 
And I mean, there is something to that, right? I mean, if you want to run a business, you need to know how to run a business. You can't just up and run a business because you believe in it. So there is, there is something to having an education, whether or not it's formal, that's another thing, right? Now, in your case, you have had a formal education and it has worked for you because you've said some things that are really important. I want to have you uh, explain here today. Okay. Okay. So the first one is um, knowledge versus application. Talk about what the difference is, please. Yeah, so I I use this example in my own life. So I went to college, got an accounting degree. It With the accounting degree, they teach you how to manage other people's money. They teach you how to track, how to report on it, how to do all the things for someone else's money. But the application is missing because you don't even they you're never taught how to do it with your own money with your own personal finances right so we have this knowledge we have this skill set yet when it comes to applying it to your own personal debits and credits your own personal budgets and expenses uh it's it's different it's you know it 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 has to be um practiced it has to be observed it has to be, you know, it's just not a one size fit all. And that's one thing about personal finance is very personal, right? So what's good for you or what uh, process or app or, you know, thing that may work for you may not work for me and my situation and my personality and, and what makes me feel uh, safe or secure or even stabilized. Uh, but that's one of the biggest things that I call out, especially to uh, business students, because people automatically think, oh, you have an accounting degree. You have a business degree. You must be good in math. No, (laughs) I'm not good in math. I'm good at following rules. I'm good at memorizing what the rules say. I'm good at being able to go and research where that rule comes from and then applying it to the, uh, you know, taking that example and then applying that fact pattern to this fact pattern. Uh, but when it comes to your own um, accounting, your own personal finances, it could get very tricky if you've never, like I said, observed it, if you've never practiced it, um, if you if you don't have any examples of someone who's done something well, um, it could get really tricky. <laughs> I, I love that. I really do. I think I think that's a really important message. So I appreciate you sharing that. The other one is to spin consciously. What does it mean to spin consciously? Yeah, so when um, our America teaches us um, to be consumers, right? So very great example. Um, There's a researcher who does a $100 bill challenge to elementary school students. He'll hold up a $100 bill and he'll say, what should I do with this? What would you do with this $100 bill? And nine out of 10, most of the kids are going to say, oh, I'm going to buy something. I'm going to spend something. And that's at very early, that's at a very early age, right? Um, our our society does not promote us uh, or, you know, from early ages, it doesn't teach us how to make the money work for us. It doesn't talk to us about investing our money for it to grow and double in size. No, it teaches us to spend um, grow the economy, you know, by by spending and supporting all these retailers. You can have all the things you want. You can look the part. You can wear the material things. That's going to make you feel good. Like just think about how many advertisement advertisements we may see or are pushed to us um, in a single day over, you know, thousands and thousands of messages. But there aren't that many messages that promote for us to think about our future selves, to think about the generations that come behind us, to think about what what it is we need, we really need to do to build real wealth. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about spending consciously, I'm talking about raising that awareness, um, specifically for our young people to make sure they understand those differences between, um, you know, being pushed and, you know, being influenced to make a purchase and also being conscious of, okay, 
how does that affect what my ultimate goal is? Does that company align with my values? Do they support people that look like me? Um, do they, you know, just all the things that we need to be conscious about when we're spending our money. So one of the things I really talk to our young people about is how, you know, maybe you're not 18 yet. You don't have the power to vote, but you do have the power to spend. Advertisers spend millions, if not billions of dollars every year trying to influence our young consumers and therefore their parents, because they're talking to the kids. The kids are the one going to the parents to say, oh, I want that Apple or, you know, that new Apple product or, oh, I want these new Jordans or Nikes or whoever the biggest athlete is at the time. Um, so our kids have so much influence in how our dollars are spent, but but off, but wanting to impress upon them that while like while you still have the know with all the wherewithal to know what you like what's stylish to make those decisions you can also put forth some of that energy to go do some research to say hey um what does the ceo care about like who what else what other uh causes do does this company promote or fund like, what do they do outside of making the coolest looking shoe that you like or maybe you dislike, right? So just teaching them to be thinkers and um, to use th that, that same energy that they have uh, to, to learn all the words of the latest song or to learn the latest TikTok dance, uh, to use it to, to really understand where their money is going. And is it helping them? reach the goal? Is it pushing things that they like? Or is it really tearing them down behind closed doors? I think that has to start very young. Yeah. You know, the consciousness really needs to start young because that, that teenage takes over and there's a whole set of different values. So it, I, I agree with you. I think that's inc incredibly important. It breaks my heart when I see people putting money behind, um, can, you know, products that, that absolutely go against who we are. It's heartbreaking. Um, yeah. yeah. And I'm going to give, give another example. And it's almost throwing right. my, my parents under the bus a little bit. Uh, but, you know, just as you think about things, you're like, wait a minute. So, you know, my parents, again, big promoters of education, but they weren't very, um, they weren't very, they weren't very knowledgeable when it comes to like black history, you know, you know, that that wasn't a part of what my parents talked to us about or really pushed. And I can remember one holiday, one Christmas, really wanting this uh, Dukes of Hazard dashboard <laughs> with the Confederate flag and all the things. We used to watch Dukes of Hazard. We were big fans of Bo and Daisy and all the things. But now as I'm old, I'm like, wait a minute. I know my parents <laughs> didn't have us watching this stuff. We were bought, I actually got it for Christmas. So I'm just like, man, we just, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, now a lot of this information, just like with personal finance information, just like with financial education, it is now so readily available to us. It, it's not going to take you hours to go find some truth or to find something um that if it doesn't align with who you are or who you want, who you desire to be, uh, it won't take you long for that stuff to be uncovered. Um, but just thinking about, man, like I wish my parents that were more like taught us that at a younger age. And then, you know, right, right. now we know. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, I appreciate that example. And that, you know, that, that segues nicely into the next question, which is about uh, how history impacts our spending. And one of the things you mentioned in a, in a uh, interview did was the Birmingham bus boycott, you know, and you said you used it as a financial example. And I'd like you to repeat that if you don't mind, because it really, it emphasizes how history makes a difference going along with the conscious spending and understanding how history informs our present day spending and financial literacy. Do you mind breaking that down a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't actually remember this exact example. <laughs> okay. Let me, but, let me, I'll tell you more. I'll tell okay, you more. Okay. Basically, you were, you were talking about what happened during the Birmingham boycott, you know, how, how where we put our money during that time mattered, right? Because 
we had the opportunity to influence things, right? We can, we can yeah. shut down things and we can redirect financial power and how, if we're not conscious of that, we miss an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you're right. So history does play a, a major role, which is why it's so important for us to know where we've been, to know, you know, so which is why I'm really excited and was really pleased with the amount of um, press media coverage that Black Wall Street, the massacre of, you know, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, started receiving, though, you know, it's always feel like sometimes a little too late. Exactly. However, the fact that it has been now uncovered and, and there are so many conversations around reparations and how you can um, restore the financial legacies of those families, which, you know, those calculations make my head spin. But however, okay. but I think it's an important conversation, right? We can't just allow history to, um, to one, repeat itself, but for it to remain uh, covered. And so oftentimes I will uh, refer to how Germany has done, when you talk about the Holocaust and you look today where they are still prosecuting uh, people who were Nazis and these people are like 90, they're in their 90s and they're saying, so what? We don't care that you're 90 years old. <laughs> you will pay for your crimes. You will pay for the things you did wrong. But when you look at America, we, we now know we now know where the woman who falsely accused Emmett Till and, you know, but we're like, oh, no, we, she's old. Mm -hmm. We're going to leave her alone. Or, right. you know, this person now has cancer. They're, you know, they're paying their price. But no, hold, hold these people accountable. Um, and so it's important for our kids to know the history, right? To know even, I, you know, I often talk about... Um, Black Wall Street, not from the massacre standpoint, but from just what people who look like me and you were able to build um, yeah. from, from discrimination, right? So from the discrimination that they faced, from the segregation, but look how brilliant we were. Look how business-minded we were. Look how profitable we were to build a whole city a whole town within you know a, you know a few a couple of blocks and mm -hmm. how prosperous we were that it that it spurred so much hate and jealousy um mm -hmm. for others who you know who didn't who didn't want us to have what we had and and made sure we didn't have it for long right right with so little you know they did all right. of that with so little so imagine today what can happen you said you yeah. said another thing which was um Use credit responsibly. What does that mean? Yeah. So when I talk about using credit responsibly, um, credit is one of the biggest things that that tears us down. It's just it's just when you look at the common denominator uh, for people who fall into financial issues, financial troubles, financial pitfalls, it's often because we have used and or abused credit. And when I, when I talk to people, when I go and speak to different colleges and universities, it all falls around education. Nobody told me. I didn't know. I didn't understand how it worked. Um, I was pitched, you know, to open up a credit card. They gave me a free T-shirt or a free water bottle, especially in the case when I was coming up through North Carolina A&T, the, the credit card companies would just sit on campus give you free pizza party to open up a card. Um, when you talk about uh, families who, like I talked to my, my dad about it, right? So my dad, he was like, I couldn't teach you anything about credit cards because my parents never had credit cards. So he was the first generation to even use credit cards and he didn't know what he didn't know. And so he never thought to even talk to us to give us the, the warning signs about it. Um, yeah, I can remember him even encouraging my sister, my oldest sister, to make sure she had a gas card. So if if nothing else, mm. she could fill up her car with gas and get to point, you know, get to wherever she needed to to go next. 
but we never had real conversations about credit. And so as a result, on average, college students graduate with about three to four thousand dollars of credit card debt. And what are they spending it on? Likely they are spending it on the luxuries, the conveniences of life, right? Without really getting the lesson, which is why I want I talk about using credit responsibly sooner. Like we need to talk to them about, you know, um, so I run money camps for kids, right? So as young as age 10, we are talking about credit cards because when I first kind of jumped into this personal finance space, I would do workshops talking to um, high school juniors and seniors. They are like scholars. They're the that making A's and B's. They're getting ready to make some big, financial decisions at age 17 and 18, where they're going to school, what kind of, what career they want to pursue, but they struggled to even share with me or tell me the difference between a debit card and a credit card. And that blew my mind. I was like, wait, these babies don't know. And the more we move into digital currency, the more we move into situations where there is no cash passed down from one hand to the next. The more things are digitized on the computer, no real emotional connection because all you're doing is tapping, dipping, swiping. Um, It could become really easy to disconnect yourself from the transactions that are actually being made and the fact that you have to pay this bill at the end of 30 days. So just making sure our young people understand how things that we probably take for granted now because we become masters at it. We've learned from trial and error. We've learned from our own mistakes. Maybe we saw somebody, um, but it's rarely a conversation. Uh, So the younger we start talking to them about it so they understand, um, the goal is to prevent them from falling into these same mishaps or making the same missteps that we may have made as young adults. That is so smart. That's so smart. I really appreciate the emphasis on that. And that answered my next question as well. So I'm going to go right into the book. And I have to say, I have to be honest, if this was, if this title was used for a, a white author, I might have some feelings about it. No, I would have some feelings about it. But given who you are, right? Ooh, tell me Using more. Words, I want to know more about that. Okay, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because it's called The Master Playbook. So oh. if that was a white author, I, I might have some some racial <laughs> trauma hit me some kind of sort of way. But since it's you, I'm good. I'm good. So You know, I never thought about that. And let me tell you why I call it the master playbook. So, you know, when you're young, you're trying to figure out what, what do I want my business to be called and what do I want it to be named? Um, and one, I'm a big sports fan. So I love uh, football, basketball, all the things. And so I was like, okay, playbook. I like playbook because playbook gives you the rules that lays out the plays that you're going to do, what moves you need to be making, how we're going to come together as a team. So yes, I want to leave a blueprint, a playbook, right? The master actually came from my belief as a Christian. So if you read my book, it is filled with scriptures to support each of the five money habits. And um, so the master for me came from my belief in God, the father, you know, Jesus as his son, using his word, the Bible as guidance and direction on laying out the playbook. Because I don't know if you know this, but the Bible uh, has the greatest number of scripture that speaks to money than any other topic. That's why. And so, um, and so, yes, yeah, so it's, the, this book is actually, actually biblically Base ties into a lot of scripture to support the money lessons that I talk about. And you're black, so using the word mastery any way you want works for me. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you know, I have never thought of that before. <laughs> well, okay, okay. This is good. I'm getting new perspectives. Well, and also, you know, as a therapist, one of the things we're taught early on is mastery you know, having the mastery is, is having the skill. It's, it's really learning the skill. Well, unfortunately, most of the therapeutic concepts are based in a Eurocentric history. So that, that, that 
is a little bit of a trigger too, but I love how you explain that. I appreciate that so much. Let's get into the book a little bit. We don't have much time left, so I want to hit, I want to hit the key okay, points. Okay. You already talked about how early you should start. It's never too early to, to, to really start to teach some of these basics. So, so what is, why should I, I'm going to say this differently. Why should every parent have this book in their toolkit? Yes. So every parent should have this book um, because it is written to be a resource, a resource that you can refer back to from time to time as your children mature and grow. We want to make sure that they have these five building blocks, these five, you know, money habits in their toolkits um, because it's most everything is going to come back to one of these money habits. Okay. And so uh, I wrote the book intentionally for parents with school age kids. So whether your child is four, 12, 18, as long as they're in your house living under your roof, you're still giving guidance and support and trying to lead them um, on the right path and make great decisions, then this is going to be a book that you can use as a resource. Um, so that's Love. why every parent should have it. That's great. And and also, what is the biggest mistake that working class parents make financially that their kids are watching? Okay, so the biggest mistake I would say is um, they don't set expectations for their kids. Or, or if they do, they don't hold them accountable to it, right? So um, one of the biggest, so I'll, I, I'll, show, I'll give you an example. I get questions like this. Oh, Holly, my teen has his first job, but with his paychecks, all he's doing is buying the latest video games or the latest sneakers or whatever. And I'm like, well, what, what expectation did you set for how that paycheck should be sent? You're still the parent. And they're like, well, it's his money because he's working the job. I was like, I understand, but he still lives under your roof, your household. You still set the expectation, right? So I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, oh, there's another one. Okay, so so being sure to set the expectation, but also holding your child accountable. The other thing I see, unfortunately, our generation may be the first generation that has um, lots of disposable income, right? And so we find what I see a lot is parents are trying to give their kids the world because they didn't have the world. Right. They're trying um, wait, to wait, 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 Holly, Holly, Holly. I'm going to need you to say that again, because I say that about a hundred times a week. So I'm going to need you to say that again. Go ahead. Just say yes. it again. Yes. They, we are these parents. I'm, I'm in this age group too, where we want to give our kids all the things we want to make sure they have everything that we didn't have. And I understand that. Listen, I understand where that's coming from. Um, but you see it in all facets of life, whether it's, oh, my child is playing sports because I couldn't play sports or oh, my child, you know, I want them to have this exposure. I want them to go on this trip. I want them to have these material things because when growing up, I could not have these things. We couldn't afford it. Or my parents always told me no. And I understand that. But what our what the parents also need to make sure is that there's some lesson. There's a lesson in all of this. We need to make sure our kids understand the value of uh, the things that there are consequences um, because we don't want to raise a generation of entitled adults, right? Where And that, that's exactly what we're doing, unfortunately. <laughs> and so, look, I'm doing my best to be like, hey, hey, <laughs> y'all hold up for a minute. What is this teaching your child? How are they going to be independently? How are they going to develop their own independent thoughts? Where are you allowing them to think critically to make their own decisions? Where are you allowing them to fall, fail, make a mistake? Because if you look at the biggest lessons in your life, if I look at the biggest lessons in my life is where I didn't get something I wanted. I failed at something I attempted. And those are the biggest life lessons. Those are where you t you get the most out of it. So you knew, so you know, I'm not going to do that again. 
or I'm going to do this differently, or I'm going to be prepared so that that doesn't happen again. Um, and so parents, we just need to make sure that fine, give them, give them some of the things, but make them work for it. I just wrote down earlier today that I was going to go find a list of celebrities because, you know, everybody wants, everybody takes advice from celebrities. And I was going to do these case studies on um, rich and famous celebrities and how they treated their kids growing up. So, for example, uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Everybody knows Shaquille O'Neal, um, wealthy superstar, athlete, entrepreneur, all the things. He made a deal with his kids that, you know, you're not going to get any of my money until you go, you graduate from college and you got to go get a master's degree or a graduate degree. I think that was like some, some kind of implication for his, like they have to go achieve and do some things on their own before they have access to his wealth. Another one is, um, oh, uh, Anderson Cooper. He's, you know, everybody knows Anderson Cooper, big CNN uh, personality, but his mother was Gloria Vanderbilt. You know, she did the fashion, whatever. She didn't give him anything. <laughs> she didn't leave him nothing, anything, because she wanted him to, de to develop that work ethic um, and to have that, I don't even know, what, what do you call it? That oomph to go and, and find your own way to Under make something out of yourself without relying on the empire that I have built. Now, yeah. I don't agree with giving them nothing, but I do agree <laughs> with the idea and the philosophy of not giving you so much that you don't do anything, not giving you so much that you are just 100% reliant on me and drawing down on the wealth that I've built instead of using your gifts, your skills, your interests, your passion, to take what I what I pass along to you and multiply it, grow it, make it bigger and better than what what I could have left you for generations that are going to come behind you. Uh, look, you are so smart, so lovely. Um, I could do this for another hour, so you have to come back. I already knew this wasn't going to be enough time for all the questions I have because you know there's these nuances that you talk about that are just so incredibly important and they're easy to be missed in the day to day raising of your children because most working class parents are just trying to figure it out one foot in front of the other. And they yes. don't think about how these nuanced elements impact their child's future and their future. Cause who's going to take care of them right now? We're raising a grip of people. Well, I'm not, but people are raising a grip of people who with no empathy, a little compassion, no ability to care for other people mm. and they're not financially sound. So this is all so important. Thank you for taking the time to come and share some of your knowledge today. More importantly, I need you to tell everyone where they can find you and where they can find your book. Yes, you can find me everywhere across social media at The Master Playbook. Also, themasterplaybook.com. The book is available on my website and um, everywhere books are sold, Amazon, all the things. Well, I plan on this. This is the only gift I'm giving this year is your book to the parents that I know. So <laughs> trust and believe we are passing this along. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being so great. And I uh, hope you'll come back again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Look, this is what changing the narrative means. So you take care of yourself and stay tuned. Thank you. All right. Bye. bye.